everyone, welcome to The Gig, a series about film and TV from behind the scenes and on the screen. We're your hosts, Layla T. Rosario. And Jessica L. Ransom. And today we are so grateful to have executive producer, writer, showrunner, Jacqueline Moore from Dear White People on Netflix. We were never as alive as we were that year. This is how we do it. Yes, yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, it is totally a pleasure. And we would love to discuss the final season of Dear White People. Can you tell us a little bit about the making of the show? Sure. So the um, creator of the show and other show, I'm one of two showrunners on the show, um, but the creator and, and uh, my fellow showrunner, Justin Simeon, um, came to me for season four. Um, which we knew was going to be our last season. And we're just like, I think uh, it should be a musical. And I was like, that's crazy. Um, but maybe crazy in a good way. Um, and, you know, now that it's out, I suppose that's up for the world to decide if it was crazy in a good way. Um, but I am a musical theater queer, as is Justin. And so we went for it. And um, we conceived this entire kind of season that had this kind of meta narrative um, about, you know, adulthood and um, looking back on your chat, like nostalgia and sort of what this industry does to you and um, the ways in which it, uh, you know, you sometimes, it's very hard to feel like you've accomplished anything, even when you've accomplished anything. Because when you do, then sort of the, <laughs> the reel of the game is laid bare. Like for a while, you have this moment where you're like, oh my God, I'm making TV and movies and stories for a job. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's my dream. And then you realize that you're actually making like, like the fact that they call it content now is not like an accident. Like you're making what they see as, and by they, I mean, these corporations that run these companies, uh, that run these like streamers or networks or whatever, um, you're just making like widgets to fill their widget stores. And like, they often don't really care what those widgets are. I mean, your immediate people, your executives, your people, like they care because they want to make great stuff. But like, you realize that like the, the truth of the game is a little more like, you know, a little less artistically driven, which has always been the case, but the show sort of season four was sort of about Justin and I feeling that in our own lives and our own careers and kind of putting that through these characters in this place where they are at both maybe their most idealistic, which is like, you know, you're finishing college, you're about to go enter the world, anything is possible you're singing and dancing, you know, we put it in, we put the past in musical form for a reason. Um, you know, it, it captures that, that idealism and that hope. Um, and in the future, you're a little beaten down and you're even in success, you're a little beaten down and you're trying to recapture um, some of that feeling, some of that, like we could do anything feeling. So. Thank you for that. Um, could you get more into a deeper dive about your role on the show and what does that look like for you as an executive producer, writer, and showrunner? Justin and I produced the show. So we we say, you know, Justin's a director as well. Um, so he directed a few episodes and I um, show ran. So I was on set for every episode and, you know, worked with the directors and gave notes on acting and made sure that we got coverage we needed. And helped pick costumes and did casting and auditions and talked about props and what props were good and what props were bad and set design. And, you know, it's really like everything you see on the show has gotten a yay or nay from Justin or me or both. And then we supervise it through post. So we supervise it through the editing process, through, um, you know, ADR, through, um, yeah, through the edit and through um, mixing and then final cut. And 
then it's on television. Great. So um, a lot of our viewers aren't really well versed in like, you know, the writer's room and show running. So I guess my biggest question for like people trying to get in the industry, how do you get into the writer's room on like, especially like a show like Dear White People? Ooh, it's a very hard thing. Um, here's what I would say. There are like three ways to break into television writing. Um, way number one is to be a white guy who goes to Harvard and is on the Harvard Lampoon. If you've done that, congrats, you're probably gonna get a career. I did not do that. Uh, most people don't do that, can't do that, whatever. Um, so that leaves us, the rest of us, with two ways to break it. And I think the best way to go to do it is a combination of these two ways, um, if this is what you really wanna do. So way one is to be making things constantly. Um, if you wanna be a TV writer, you should be uh, writing plays and producing them. You should be writing scripts, obviously writing TV scripts. You should be making short films. You should be making web series. You should be um, writing funny articles for the internet. You should truly create, create, create. The only thing you can control is your output. Um, you can't control what Hollywood does with it, but you can control how much you make. And the only option then is, the only thing you can control is to be as prolific as possible. Um, and you do that because you don't know what the thing is that's gonna get Hollywood's attention. When you get Hollywood's attention, if you're so lucky, you want to have the scripts already. So like the day that Hollywood the day the president of Hollywood <laughs> calls you and is like, which really just looks like agencies or management reps or whatever calling you and saying like, oh, I, we liked this thing you did. Do you have pilots? Do you have features? Do you have plays? Like, do you have scripts? You want the answer to be, yes, I do, here they are. You don't want the answer to be, Ooh, not yet, but if you give me six months, I'll get them to you because you've kind of just blown your opportunity. Doesn't mean you can't get it back, but what you really want is to have stuff for the day they ask for it. Um, so for me, what that looked like was I was doing stand-up comedy. Um, I don't love stand-up comedy, but I was doing it because I was like, maybe that's a way to get people to read the scripts that I've written. Um, I had written tons of scripts. I had produced written and produced off, off, off Broadway plays, um, very far off. Um, I had, uh, yeah, done stand up. I was like writing in the media. I had like found a way to like freelance at big websites. I started writing for GQ. I like was right working at Buzzfeed. I was like, just like making stuff, you know, in every direction, kind of willy nilly. Um, and one of the things I made was a Twitter account with a friend of mine that went viral. Um, that was like modern. It was log lines for um, episodes of Seinfeld, if the show were still on the air. And like what they would be talking about today, what episode premises would be. And it got like six, 700,000 followers at the time and got written up in Variety and Hollywood Reporter and New York Times. And so suddenly agencies were like, hey, do you have scripts? I could send them scripts right away. And I was signed within, I don't know, a month of those first um, inquiries. And then I was staffed on a show within six months. Like that's way too, is to make something and come in through a side door. Um, way three is to, is something I didn't do. And I look back and I was like, you're so lucky Jacqueline that you did not, um, that you did not do this and still have a career because I should have done this. And if I could go back and do it again, I probably would do this, um, which is to move to LA or New York or Atlanta, um, anywhere there's production and to start PAing and working assistant jobs and trying to work your way up through the system. Um, it could take a long time. I know people who've taken 10, 15 years to do that but they've done it. Yeah, it, it's a thing. Um, I would recommend to everybody that the way to get into the writer's room, the most efficient way, and I feel like this probably actually applies to, to you, Jessica, with what you guys are doing exactly, 
which is you do both. You do some version of two and three, um, where you're making your own stuff, you're building your own empire, you're, you're trying to make it happen yourself, but you're also working within the bullshit of Hollywood. If you're making things that people like and you're working those jobs, suddenly you have FaceTime with all these people who make decisions. And the truth is, I mean, I know as a showrunner and an executive producer, when the show gets done, I turn around and the people who were like really good on set, the PAs, the ADs, the whatever, I offer to read their work. I, you know, and I mean it. And so, yeah, I would say some combination of two and three is, is the way to go. What's next for you in your career? Um, I am currently in New Orleans where I am show running, writing and executive producing, co-show running again, but writing and executive producing um, the reboot of Queer as Folk for Peacock, um, which I think will be very good, which will be coming probably summer 2022. Um, but it is very gay. Um, it is unlike the previous versions of the show, it is not all cis white guys. Um, so that's an improvement. I'm a big believer in, especially this idea of like reboots and stuff. I, I, I get the, I'm as exhausted by a lot of them as everybody else is, where it's like, what about new ideas? And look, I agree. I'm out here pitching new ideas all, all the goddamn time. But I will say, if you're going to do a reboot, I really believe that there is value in doing reboots that change who the stories are about. Re we're reading a show that was famously cis, white, gay, and we now have a cast that is mostly people of color, that is that two of the series regulars are trans characters. Um, and there are more trans characters beyond that. Um, and, you know, that's, I don't know, that, that to me is, there's power in that. Yeah, speaking of reboots, I love the L word reboot actually. So, and yeah, that's, that's been pretty good. So, it's been I have fun. not watched yet. So, this is, we are going in a different, I've watched a little, I should say. I've only, I've not, I'm not caught up. Um, but we are going in a slightly different direction than them, um, which I always feel the need to tell people just so they, so people that are giant fans of the original, I think they will be fans of this one. Um, but we are not doing the L word like sequel series kind of thing or the sex in the city sequel series um so much as we are doing like a spiritual successor um you know it's it's its own thing um, um so i'm glad you brought that up just because brought up the work because they it's two very different i mean they're doing similar ideas in terms of like diversifying and like the, you know all stuff but um just in terms of of approaches to reboots um uh, you know i don't want to falsely advertise it's exciting to tell stories that uh, I feel like our show is the only show that can tell them or among the only shows. Amazing. And any final thoughts that you want to say about the industry or the show or your career before we wrap up today? All of the unions and guilds need to have better trans health care. That's, I'm currently in a fight with the Writers Guild over trans health care costs. And it's I would be better off working 25 hours a week at Starbucks, literally. Like Starbucks has better healthcare than the Writers Guild of America, so. Hugs, 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 I love hugs, you. Hugs, hugs, love you both. So grateful to have executive producer, writer, showrunner, Jacqueline Moore from Dear White People on Netflix. Mm -hmm.